I'll start by inviting the chairman of the World Diamond Council, that is Ms. Tikeli Isabov, to give, to give us a brief remarks. President of Zimbabwe, His Excellency Robert Mugabe, the former President of South Africa, Mr. Tavo Mbeki, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Zimbabwe, Professor Arthur Mutapapra, uh, the Minister of Mines of Zimbabwe, uh, Dr. Uh, Albert Mapufu, the incoming chair of the Kimberley Process, uh, Minister or Excellency Ms. Uh, Susan Shabango, and of course the current KP Chair, Ambassador uh, Gideon Milovanovic, uh, dear fellow delegates, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and of course all protocols observed. Over the many years that I've been involved in the public life of the diamond business, I've been lucky enough to visit and speak at many venues, some of them in truly spe spectacular settings. But I can say with confidence that Victoria Falls, just a short way away from here, is the most stunning I've ever seen in terms of its raw natural beauty. I congratulate the conference organizers for their inspired decision to hold this event in this place. None of us should overlook the symbolic significance of the venue, for it emphasizes the natural wealth that is contained in this corner of the world. Local people call the waterfalls Mosi wa Tunia, excuse my pronunciation, or the smoke of thunders. But to the world it is known as Victoria Falls in honor of the queen that ruled the British Empire when it was discovered by the Scottish explorer David Livingstone in the year 1855. Now I tell you this, not to give you a lesson in history or geography, but rather to illustrate that there is a frequently a difference between Western and African perspective. When I was young, we were taught that David Livingstone discovered the waterfalls. But of course, they were well known to local people for centuries. <laughs> Indeed, I suspect that nobody really knows who first discovered them. <laughs> what Livingstone did, of course, was to bring the waterfalls into the Western consciousness. And, and as was the custom, they were then made to show their association with the British Empire. It was only with the establishment of the independent Zambia in 1964 and then an independent Zimbabwe in 1980 that the length of the waterfall came to the full control of the Africa's indigenous people. The continent's diamond resources are similarly associated with its colonial past but with a fundamental difference. For while the waterfalls are fixed in place, and it is extremely unlikely they will ever be moved and reassembled in another location, the ultimate value of the gem diamond is fixed by customer in consumer markets, and those markets, more often than not, are located outside Africa. Now, do not be that misunderstanding. I'm not contending that the consumer holds the absolute or even primary power because without diamond being extracted from earth, there is nothing to talk of in the first place. What I'm saying is that when it comes to natural diamonds, the producer is reliant upon 
the consumer, just as the consumer is reliant upon the producer. In the diamond pipeline, we are all interconnected and all interdependent. It is fair to say that until the end of the last century, we in the diamond industry were not fully aware of this interdependency. The advent of conflict diamond prices and the realization that the product we handle were associated with the suffering of innocent people in mining countries was for many of us a rude awakening. But we were ready to act. And we did by playing what I can confidently say was an imperative role in the establishment of the Kimberley Process Certification Scheme, to which we added the WDC system of warranties. And in doing so, we worked together with officials of governments from rough diamond mining countries, diamond cutting trade centers and consumer centers, as well as with representatives of civil society. We did not always agree at first, but we were equally commit uh, committed to finding solutions. The dynamic that was created often late into the night, created a common bond. It also engendered empathy for other sides' points of view. And sense of mutual trust. We came to appreciate that even when we don't see eye to eye, our intentions were true and honest. What I and my colleagues in the industry came to understand more fully is that in countries like South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, Sierra Leone, Angola, the DRC, Guyana, Tanzania, Ghana, Lesotho, and now Zimbabwe, millions of people regard the diamond not only as the most beautiful and valuable gemstone on the face of Earth, but also an agent for better life for them and their children. We came to realize that men and women who were seated around the table with us as their mission and task of securing economic future of their country. It has been said before that most of the world considers the diamond, the diamond jewelry to be a luxury and non-essential product. And while we understand why this is the case, it is not an opinion shared by the men and women involved in the diamond trade and industry. For us, too, the diamond is source of our livelihood. It is because the diamond is essential to us that we are so acutely aware of the consumer sentiment and do all we can to ensure that natural romance mystery and the legacy of the stone remains unblemished. I also know that this understanding is appreciated by my African colleagues. Even during the most difficult months of 2010 and 2011, when tempers ran high and emotions were on a razor edge, nobody left the table. We carried on talking. It was clear to everyone that the Kimberley process was the only game in town. And without it, we were all likely to lose. Over the past several years, <clears throat> I spent some challenging but always fascinating times with Minister Mpufu, who is a man I feel you all agree with me does not hesitate to speak his mind. There were those who believed that he would shake the industry to the very foundation. And two years ago, few would have predicted that he would be presiding over a gathering such as this, a conference in Zimbabwe, with the leadership of our business and Kimberly process in attendance. Minister Mokufu 
please accept my compliments for initiating this conference and my thanks for the generous way in which we have been hosted in your beautiful country. And in particular, let me congratulate you for inviting the KP Chair, Ambassador Milovanovic, to be a keynote participant, thereby emphasizing Zimbabwe's commitment to the cumulative process. Ambassador Milovanovic is also deserving our congratulations. She assumed the sensitive position of KP Chair at a time when the role of the United States was viewed with a degree of suspicion by a good number of delegations in the Kimberley process. And over the past almost 11 months, while she has re remained true to her convictions, she also demonstrated a sympathetic understanding of the position of others in the KP, in particular of those of the African producing countries. Ambassador Milovanovic has also emphasized what has been a fundamental principle in the organization, and one that we in the World Amicum Council believe is critical to existence, and that is decisions cannot be taken unilaterally. They must come through multilateral discussions with appropriate time and effort invested in order to arrive at solutions which are acceptable across the board. I strongly believe that the success that Ambassador Milovanovic has had in advancing the AP agenda during her term in office has been aided significantly by the partnership that developed with the country holding the position of the Vice Chair South Africa and understanding from the very beginning that the American and South Africa terms in office were interlinked. A sense of common purpose was established from the start and this engendered an atmosphere of cooperation. At the annual meeting of the World Army Council in Italy this year, I had the privilege of being seated between Ambassador Milovanovic and South Africa Minister of Mineral Resources, Ms. Susan Shavango. Together, they represented the unified position of the Kimberley process. It was a powerful and important message for our industry and the world. In her address to the WEC annual meeting, Minister Shabango spoke eloquently about the role the diamond should play downstream in African producing countries. Diamond beneficiation has the potential, the potential to become the major driver in advancing the empowerment of the historically disadvantaged, she said, presenting opportunity for new entrepreneurs in large and small scale ventures that the development of diamond sector has immense economic potential and could contribute positively in addressing the socio-economic issues that challenge democracy and nation building in the region, Minister Shabango told us. In healing over many cracks that has developed in the family process recent years, Ambassador Milovanovic has not shied away from tackling the pressing challenges facing the organization. <coughs> Among them is reform of the organization, including establishment of permanent administrative support mechanism, or ASM, which will provide logistic, organizational, and communication support to the KP on an ongoing basis. <coughs> Irrespective of who is the KP chair at any point of time, the World Bank Council has proposed that it takes the responsibility for the management of the ASM, which it would do with the collaboration of four of its members, which include the German Jewelry Export Promotion of India, the Israel Diamond Institute, the Anglo World Diamond Center, and the Diamond House of the Government of Ghana. The ASM would provide a significant upgrade 
to the management of the KP. But undoubtedly, most sensitive tackled by the ambassador Mugabe during the past year has been the expansion of the limit of conflict times. So that it applies to a less narrowly defined range of human rights issues. She used the occasion of the 2012 WBC annual meeting in Italy to propose that conflict diamonds come to include rough diamonds used to finance or otherwise are directly related to armed conflict or other situation of violence. The WBC General Assembly immediately endorsed her suggestions as to the proposal that would be constructive in advancing the discussion on the expanded definition of conflict violence. Clearly, with the problem that is so closely associated with human emotions of love and commitment, it is nobody's interest that the diamond, the diamond be associated with organized violence. But we, the World Diamond Council, insist that the expanded definition be carefully considered with all parties consulted and that the decision be arrived through consensus. Most importantly, it needs to be specific, be directly associated with the diamond production, and be something that we are able to implement within the context of our existing structure. The purpose of the Kimberley process is to defend the diamond pipeline so the diamond business will serve the legitimate interests of all its stakeholders. It should never become a tool to advance narrow political interests of one group or another. Zimbabwe <clears throat> is a country that should come to be considered a role model for the diamond business in promoting sustainable development. For while it has formidable economic and social challenges, it also is blessed with very significant rough diamond deposits, which hold the potential to improve the quality of life for all the citizens. It is an enabling countries like Zimbabwe to meet its challenges that is the essence of the mission of the Kimberley process. It is why we are gathered in this beautiful setting here today, and it is why the Diamond World Diamond Council is proud to be a member of this forum. I thank you for your attention.